Now, coming from Cantor Health, which is the healthcare agency within the larger Cantor group of companies, my focus today will be on healthcare. But you'll see how some of the ideas I share, uh, some of the things we are working on, planning on working on, could apply to your business, to pretty much any product or service category. But real quick, just for those who may not be familiar with what the quantified self-movement is, what it means. Uh, from a very simple perspective, it's just the use of technology to acquire data on daily aspects of one's personal life in terms of input, what goes into your body, uh, biological and mental states, and physical performance. So in terms of inputs, we're talking about the food you eat, the over-the-counter or pharmaceutical drugs you may be ingesting, uh, the sleep you're taking in, the quality of the air you breathe, states, your mood, your emotion, your uh, stress level, blood pressure, heart rate, uh, if you're a diabetic, uh, blood glucose, blood sugar levels would be important. And physical performance speaks for itself. Now, quantified self, we always sometimes like to make things more difficult than they really are. I think a much simpler term is self-tracking, because let's face it, that's really what we're talking about here. But back in 2007, the editors of Wired magazine coined the phrase quantified self. And now here we are seven years later, it seems to have stuck and become the accepted terminology. Okay, so seven years. Obviously, the quantified self movement is not new, but we are definitely approaching a tipping point in this movement, and I would attribute that partly to uh, more of a health consciousness among the global population, but probably more about the influx of easy to use, non-intrusive, meaning very small, uh, affordable technology that makes it easy for anyone. The least tech savvy amongst us could really do the self-tracking now. And let me tell you, you, you the technology, it's only going to get less intrusive, easy to use, and more affordable. So we're really just at the tip of the iceberg here. Passive data collection supports active data collection. This is a key point from a market research perspective. The data that we collect passively through these quantified self technologies, which range from everything from internet connected glucose monitors, heart sensors, ubiquitous fitness sensors, internet-connected scales, uh, asthma inhalers, the list goes on. The data that we're collecting passively, it supports, it supplements the data that we're collecting actively through more traditional methodology. It does not replace it. Now, what does this enable us to do? By supplementing the active with the passive, we could ask less questions of the people who are participating in our research study. And we all know how important that is. It, uh, the bad response rates we get through these long, crazy surveys these days. Uh, the data is also more accurate because it's coming straight from wearable devices. We're not relying on person-reported uh, data. So we're getting better data. Hopefully, I believe, we're getting more data while putting less of a burden on the people's whose behaviors and attitudes that we're studying. Now, you combine that with smart analysts, we could create a compelling narrative around the data, and we're really getting as close to a true 360 degree view of the consumer than was ever possible in the past. Now to get to that 360 degree view, it's imperative that we do not look at quantified self data in isolation, but in conjunction with other data sets. Uh, you know, as much as I love this passive quantified self data, it really only tells part of uh, the story. So we really need to combine it with other data sets. So, Okay, we have the data coming from the wearable tech and mobile apps. We have qualitative data coming through focus groups, interviews, uh, online research communities, survey data. And then, and here's where it gets really interesting. Oh, just trying to get the laser to work. Social media data. Because that could be a great indicator of lifestyle. Wouldn't it be great if we could start collecting lifestyle data more passively, like we could with some of the more uh, health-focused uh, metrics. So, that would be great. Uh, it's very easy on the platform we use within Cantor for people to tie in their, their Facebook, Twitter, Foursquare, LinkedIn, Reddit, MyTripIt, MyFitnessPal, any social media account. How many people are willing to do that? That's one of the questions we hope to find out soon. But you see what we're doing here. We're migrating from 
survey platforms, or from research platforms, to lifestyle platforms. Okay, so we could do this. We know that we could collect data coming from these wearable devices. We know we could integrate it on a platform with other more traditional types of data. Uh, but I was always a firm believer that just because you can do something doesn't mean you should, unless you know how to apply it intelligently. Right, so where's, where's the value in all this? Well, let's start with time. I mean, there's no definitive answer, but what would you say on average with traditional methodologies? How much time do you get with the average participant? You know, counting in attrition, so on average, we might be getting 20 minutes of a person's life in the context of an entire lifetime. This is a little slice of time. And sometimes we're making multi-million dollar decisions on this. So you get this little slice of time, and chances are these people are answering our questions based on their mindset during that little slice of time. So if I ask something like, uh, how often do you self-exam for breast cancer? How often do you work out? How often do you monitor your glucose? They'll try to reference their general practices, but most likely they're referencing their most recent practices. However, by linking into the quantified self movement, we can get more time with participants without actually requiring more of their active time. So more time <laughs> requiring less work and time from the participants. This passive self-tracking data that we're collecting through these uh, devices, wearable or otherwise, could be collected over weeks or months. And by the way, once somebody opts in to share that data and they plug that in, we also get all of the historical data as well. So we're really getting a longitudinal view of these uh, people. And we're also getting a lot less attrition, and we have a case in point that I'll share soon, but less attrition due to this tie-in. Because it no longer just has to be this one-way dialogue where people are answering our survey questions and that's it. Uh, we are now able to feed back to them a dashboard view of how they're living their life on a daily basis. Now this is providing much more value than the small rewards we may be doling out now in the form of Amazon points or small PayPal uh, payments. So obviously this, like I said, enables us to do more longitudinal type of data. It even enables us to conduct ethnographic type studies more efficiently than we were able to do in the past, or at least as close to ethnographic type studies as you know, we could get. And this is just an example of uh, the value that not only we get, but the participants in our research get. TikTok is a TikTrack is a, a partner that we work with to develop our lifestyle platform. So this is just an example of some of the dashboard feedback that participants get in terms of diabetes, obesity, asthma. So case in point, uh, Cantar's Millard Brown unit recently did a study with 200 diabetics from the UK who had the internet collected glucose monitors. About two weeks, so we were collecting the passive data and doing some short survey questions and uh, diaries, blue diaries and whatnot, and we had 90% retention. Of the 200, only five participants didn't do a full two weeks. They dropped out for that, and you know, that's way above average for us especially when we're talking about people with diabetes. So we measured a lot of things. One of those was mood levels. How, how, how does a person's mood affect their glucose monitoring activity? And no need to get into the results. The fact is that compliance in the diabetes industry is a multi-billion dollar problem. So you could appreciate the value in getting the most accurate data possible directly from the wearable devices. So now we're gonna go for an even deeper understanding of diabetics. In addition to the glucose data we were collecting passively and uh, the food and lifestyle diary we were asking for, we're now going to layer in fitness and social media data by capturing data from fitness sensors and hopefully getting enough people to tie in their social media accounts. So we're confident, just from past experience, that we'll be able to discover correlations between uh, blood glucose and exercise activity, diet, and mood, but who knows? Maybe with the lifestyle data that we're getting from the social media input, uh, we could find correlations between lifestyle, person's hobby, their travel activity, uh, or even just their personal beliefs about healthcare in general. Another thing that we're going to be able to do with this quantified self data is 
enhance our patient segmentation studies. Now for us, we do patient segmentation studies or physician segmentation studies. Uh, a lot of you in this room, I'm sure, do consumer segmentation studies uh, the, or in the B2B space. And most of you know that basically what the segmentation studies do is enables us to group consumers uh, into homogenous groups, people with the same attitudes that can be targeted profitably. Uh, this will enable us to focus marketing on not only groups that are different, uh, distinctive, but meaningfully distinctive. And of course, who could be easily identified and targeted through paid media. So by leveraging the quantified self data, we can get much more detailed and accurate around behavior and attitude. So right now, we, for behavior, instead of asking questions about how often you exercise and what your dietary needs are, you know, people are trying to think back, okay, well, what did I do this week? Now we can collect the data directly from their jawbone, their Fitbits, their Nike fuel bands. Uh, for diet habits, I think we still would need to ask about that, but we would also tie into their MyFitnessPal social media account. Likes, hobbies, music, Facebook, Reddit, Pandora, Spotify, travel, trip it. Just as important it is for us to know how people behave, just as important for us to know what they, what, what are their attitudes, what do they believe in. Again, I don't think we could rely totally on social media data for this yet, uh, but we could supplement what we're getting from them actively with, by capturing that kind of candid commentary they might be sharing on Twitter or Facebook or any other social media. Uh, destination. You know, for us, we'd be looking at what they say about healthcare, a specific disease, a specific disease state, or just general lifestyle comments. But that would obviously differ based on the topic of the research study. Another thing we're doing: oncology, serious business. So I don't want to bring this down, but one of our clients has a drug that doesn't extend the patient's life but enables patients to participate in life, the active participants as opposed to bedridden. So what we hope to do, haven't done this yet, but with a combination of fitness sensor data, pain diaries, and short surveys, that's the key, just short surveys, especially with cancer patients. We really believe we can get insights on how this new active patient population behaves against the general population. So one of the main things we want to do, using the fitness sensor data and some questions, is correlate pain levels with activity. We're trying to find what level of activity, what kind of activity triggers the most pain. And this is really going to help healthcare providers do a better job of managing patients' pains. So we can see how all well, this could benefit our client. It could also benefit the patient population as a whole. Also, monitoring their workforce contribution. This is not as uh, relevant to the wearable tech, quantified self, but uh, just real quick. Patients who are working as opposed to bedroom, they're paying into the healthcare system. Uh, this is great for insurance companies, uh, but it's also great for the whole healthcare system as a whole. It helps keep uh, premiums uh, from rising too heavily. And anybody who is in the pharmaceutical business could understand and appreciate how this kind of research could help get insurance formulary approval. Internet connected toothbrushes, yes, this is a thing. Uh, we currently, we are doing this right now. Uh, right now we've got about a thousand people who we ship these internet connected toothbrushes to and they're, they're tracking passively their, how often they brush their teeth or when they do brush their teeth, how long they're brushing for. Uh, we're also, uh, for those willing, collecting their physical activity load of data from some of the fitness sensors that they may have. Actively collecting information on their mood, food and drink, and any health issues they may have. Now, this study has nothing to do with the toothbrush. The toothbrush is a means to an end. What we're trying to do is create a credible link between good oral hygiene and overall health and fitness. Not about the toothbrush. It's about the oral care category as a whole. If we could establish this link, I mean, obviously, the benefits for any company in the oral health care industry is obvious. The more people brush their teeth, the floss, mouthwash, et cetera, et cetera, well, the more they have to replenish these products, the more they buy. So we're really doing this to grow a category. And uh, it's exciting stuff. And again, uh, we're kind of experimenting. So while we know we're already getting the brushing data 
really be interesting to see how much more they're willing to share. Room to tune tracking. We're basically entering an age where you'll be tracked for when you're in your mommy's room to your old age. Now we've been talking a lot about self-tracking and you know, people here in this room, we could do it ourselves. But some people, as they get more towards old age, uh, they might have somebody tracking for them, uh, whether it be a, a wife, a son, a caretaker. But there is no more dedicated a market for people who are tracking a new mom, expectant moms and new moms. They are tracking everything from a baby's weight to the sleep patterns to uh, their feeding, their stool, their urine, their everything. So we're going from the quantified self to quantified baby. And this is, this is a huge industry. You've got onesie sleep monitors that track it when they, during the course of the night, uh, when they wake up, when they roll over on their stomach. Uh, crazy. Internet connected baby scales. Internet connected diapers. And what we could do on the platform, lifestyle platform, is feedback to them. Uh, visually appealing, easy to understand. Uh, feedback on, okay, here's your, here was your baby's day. So this is great for us. I think uh, this is opening up all kinds of opportunities because we all know new moms are a great target market. They buy a lot of, they buy a lot of stuff. And right now, from a market research perspective, we get limited time with moms. They don't really have a consistent routine. Diabetics, they have a consistent routine. Uh, but moms, let's say the first week back from the hospital, kind of chaotic, maybe some panic. Second week, they kind of settle down a bit. Third week, maybe they come to a normalized routine. But it's really hard to get their attention and their time for market research purposes. Uh, whether to sit down and do a survey, do a phone interview and forget about being part of any focus group. But by recruiting them to connect their quantified baby data, their actual time won't be necessary. We're getting time with them, but we don't need a lot of their active involvement. And this is great. I mean, we think that uh, by doing this, we could get to engage with some of these new moms for as long as six months, if not longer. So think about the numerous applications this could have across multiple infant categories, not just uh, diapers, but infant formula, baby wipes, baby safe, carriages, cribs, et cetera. The list goes on, probably stuff I don't even, not even aware of. So, we have quantified self, we have quantified baby. I'm not gonna get too much into the next one, but you know what's next. Uh, and there are products for this. Uh, there's a product called Whisper, and you put it around the dog's neck, and you, the real dedicated owners could just basically know everything that's going on inside their dog, sleep, uh, bathroom habits, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not gonna get into that today. So kind of winding down here, I just want to say that from a marker research perspective, you know, I'm willing to be corrected, but uh, I still feel this is really mostly unexplored territory for us. Uh, we're experimenting, we're testing, uh, we're learning. Is it too much data? Uh, how many people will really be willing to tie in their Facebook and all the social media type of data? Will it require larger incentives? Uh, we don't know. Uh, we have to see how much are people willing to share and for you know, how much, what kind of incentive, despite the fact that we are giving them something back in terms of uh, quantified self or feedback. We're gonna learn because the potential benefits of this type of research mandate that we do find that optimal balance. So key takeaways. Number one, just remember, we're not talking about replacing data that we're getting from traditional methodologies. It's passive data supporting the active data. We're getting superior retention, I and mean, we only had a few examples of that, but 
and more learning is required, but it seems, uh, I feel confident in saying that we can get better retention, which makes longitudinal type of studies much more feasible. We're getting more accurate data, because the device, the you know, people have flaws, they forget, they fib, uh, but you know, what's going on inside your body, that doesn't lie. You think it's important to go from survey platforms to lifestyle platforms in this day and age. Still a lot to learn, but we are going to learn it because we know that we can get more data, we can get much better data. That's going to lead us to better insights. And for the people in this room, that's going to enable smarter, better business decisions. So that's all I've got to say. So I'm willing to take some questions. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. So do we have any questions in the audience for Brian? I'll kick off with one quick question. So when, we, when you took the, undertook the challenge of joining together these different sets of data, how, how difficult was that for your data analysts to combine those different types of data? Or was it more straightforward than you thought? Yeah. It's, it's, it's one of the major challenges. But one of the things I said is you know, so much data, but uh, with some of the yeah, visualization techniques that are available in the marketplace now, it's much more manageable. I'm not going to say it's easy. Uh, you, know, you never know what kind of correlations you're going to discover. It's kind of like the NSA thing. I mean, they cast a wide net, not knowing you know, what they're going to find. I don't want to compare us to NSA. But, uh, so we might start off with a lot of data streams. And again, the data visualization techniques make it easier to see them and analyze them. But we'll find certain data streams that have relevant correlation. So what we'll do is we'll isolate those, focus on those, ignore the others. So we start with a wide net, but the goal is to really bring it down to something much more manageable. But it's one of the major challenges. I will I'm not going to uh, live, you know, do rose-colored tinted glasses about that. Thanks. Hi, Brian. Thanks. Um, I guess my question is, uh, you mentioned this kind of reciprocal relationship where people are providing their passive data, but they also get that data back for themselves, which I understand is a kind of key stone of quantified self and self-tracking. I was wondering if you have any insight you can share about how, after participating in something uh, like this, how tracking impacts their lifestyle or their life or changes their behaviors or anything like that? Well, I would definitely think, yes. Uh, the more they know about how they're living their lives, uh, it, it, that could definitely, hopefully, impact their behavior. But that's why we do it uh, so that the things we're studying won't create any bias and we'll always have that control. So just to make sure that's, that's uh, not the case. I think like uh, the idealized, uh, forget about the market research angle for a minute, but what people are hoping to do uh, by collecting this data is find patterns about themselves that they didn't even know existed. Uh, how successful some people are, I, I, don't, I don't have that answer. Uh, but yeah, yeah you, you make a good point. Uh, sometimes participating in the research could have an impact on, on the behavior. But what we try to do is recruit people who are already doing this, as opposed to, you know, like, especially in like the uh, diabetics or uh, cardiovascular states, we want to recruit people who already have these devices. Uh, so they're basically, they're not changing their uh, behavior. But they're also getting some more incentives on top of it. I hope I answered the question. Thank you. Do you have any more questions for Brian? In that case then, thank you Brian, thank you very much. Yeah.